No, yeah. Vincent, I think you will have to start the session. Okay, I'm trying to go live now. Uh, I press the live button. We're still connecting to live. We'll see. Now, um, I think I, need, I think I, I need to lock on again. I think I have a problem. Okay. Call tech support. Let's see. It is showing live to me at least. Live button. Yeah, I have live on here. Yeah, and we seem to have one person in the room. Now, um, I just saw an email from Ron that he's spelling out. He couldn't. He couldn't get his computer to work. Um, uh -huh. um, just, a, just a two. So you, you, the two of you are the stars. But I, I can't even go live now. Let me. Let me. Um, uh, not again. Hold on. I think we are live, Winston. I've got a red dot at the top of my screen that says live. You say it's, it's live? I can see the live button. You can see the live button? Okay. So why don't you do this? Maybe I'm not quite connected. So I think, Paul, if you're live, why don't you just go ahead and present, and I will join you in, in a minute. Yeah? Why don't you just go ahead, and right. I will catch up with you. Yeah? Go ahead. I think Start I think you're on. I'm just not sure if there's anybody else in the in the group. <laughs> <laughs> we have really? one. I can see Yoon Chen in. Uh, so yeah, yeah, Chen Yoon yeah, is yeah. here. Well, she's she's one of mine. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, so she knows um, about this. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm not. So we are live together. We are live already. I think we're all on, and if I share the screen now, you see uh, the Jitri Innovation yeah, yeah, ecosystem, right? Yeah, please so, go ahead. Um, okay, uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good night to uh, to everybody. Um, my name is Paul Burrows. I'm the Vice President of the Jiangsu Industrial Technology Research Institute, or Jitri, here in Nanjing, China, and I was just going to open with a little introduction as to our background. Um, I'm going to run this presentation deliberately in uh, editing mode because it doesn't seem to sync with this presentation system if I go into presentation mode. So you'll you'll see the uh, other slides down the edge here. I can't do anything about that, I'm, I'm afraid. My animation won't work. Uh, but for those of you who are not in China, who uh, don't know where Jiangsu province is, we're this little small black area here just to the north and west of China. And in terms of uh, physical dimensions, Jiangsu is one of the smallest provinces in China. Uh, but in terms of population, that's about less than 6% of the national total, but it's still 80 million people, so about the size of a major European country. Uh, but in economically, we punch far above our weight. In terms of GDP per capita, Jiangsu is almost double that of the Chinese average in 2019. But it's worth pointing out that that's still only about half the GDP per capita of a country like Spain in Europe. We're also the number one uh, destination for foreign direct investment into China, $26 billion in 2019. And while many places saw a collapse of foreign direct investment in 2020, uh, some for obvious reasons that we don't need to go into, uh, Jiangsu actually saw an increase of about 5%. And in the first two months of 2021, it was up another 25%. So why does this small province uh, have this um, disproportionate economic clout in China? Uh, the reason is because Jiangsu is historically the manufacturing heart of China. Historically, going all the way back to the days of the Silk Road, which of course started out to the west in Xi'an, but the Silk Road was built to transport silk products manufactured in southern Jiangsu province. And since then, we've significantly diversified into heavy engineering, precision processing, turbo blades and advanced materials, a lot of electronics and automobile manufacturing. In fact, according to the UN Statistics Division, 
Jiangsu contributed 3% of the global manufacturing output to the world last year. That's more than either India, Italy, France, or the UK. So what's the point of that? Well, if you have this industry-driven economy in a place like Jiangsu, it's important to evolve that industry. And in any emerging economy, industry tends to evolve from initially a, a very rapid growth phase of labor-intensive industries, which are resource-driven, through capital-intensive industries. And in both of these cases, technology is imported into the developing country and things are made better, cheaper, or faster, or all three. And this is what I refer to as the globalization of manufacturing. And we're all well aware of that trend over the last 20 to 30 years, and it's led to global imbalances in trade and a lot of tension worldwide. Uh, this is not a sustainable mode of economic growth. To achieve true sustainable growth, the local economy has to transition to a knowledge-based, technology-intensive industry where we invest local capital in local innovation. I like to talk about this as the change from the globalization of manufacturing to the globalization of innovation. And this leads to a major challenge because where we have strength in manufacturing in Jiangsu province, we don't necessarily have enough strength in research and development to support that manufacturing and to upgrade it to an innovation-driven economy. And this is the reason for Jitri. Uh, Jitri was started in 2013. Um, it is supported by the Jiangsu provincial government although we report to an independent board of directors, and it is a market-oriented ecosystem for upgrading the industry in Jiangsu. Um, one of our platforms is an R&D platform where we create specialized research institutes around the province to fill gaps in our R&D capacity. This is filling in areas where we just don't have enough R&D expertise in the province. Uh, we've now created uh, 58 research institutes uh, around the province. But 80% of the problem, I always say, is picking the problem. Uh, where are the R&D gaps? And so in the last two years, we've been creating a new type of organization, which are partnerships, joint ventures, if you like, between Jitri and local industry. We call these our joint enterprise innovation centers, and they are not formed to do research, but they're to, to formed to look at where the gaps are and to validate where the industry needs are around Jiangsu industry. So our joint innovation centers, of which we already have over 130, uh, each of them being a partnership with a, a Jiangsu small and medium enterprise that's a leader in its particular niche of manufacturing. Uh, the job of the JICs, as we call them, is to validate those industry needs and then pass them through uh, my department at Jitri headquarters, where we connect them to our third platform, which is innovation resources, both domestically and globally. We employ strategic consultants overseas, we select leading talent as project managers to come to Jiangsu and help build the talent portion of an innovation ecosystem. And we have even set up overseas representative offices in the form of incubators. So Jitri is, to a large extent, an economic development agency with a very unique toolkit. And one of the unique tools we have from within China is the ability to fund research at an overseas partner to see it, uh, to develop it to the point where it can come into Jiangsu province. So we like to describe Jitri as two bridges, one a bridge between science and industry domestically, and another a bridge between the global innovation resource and Jiangsu industry. And this is just a brief overview. I don't have enough time on a five minute introduction to go into any detail, but you're welcome to have the slides later. Uh, 58 research institutes, mostly across Southern Jiangsu, evenly split between different technologies where there's need and the whole Jitri umbrella now then is over 10,000 research staff, uh, 3,000 postdoc and graduate students, and an annual R&D spend of 300 million US dollars a year. So our most recent institutes are all basically joint ventures because each institute is majority owned by the technical team that founds the institute. And in the title of this uh, symposium, it was mentioned uh, the importance of joint ventures for developing countries, developing economies. This is why I particularly wanted to highlight this, is that we empower these technical teams by having majority ownership of their institute, which very closely aligns their interests and their profit potential with serving local industry needs and creating clusters of innovation around Jiangsu province. And I'm happy to give you the full list of our Jitri Institutes um, offline 
uh, any time you would like. One particular type of, of uh, research institute that we operate is specifically a joint venture with overseas champion SMEs. We call these our joint R&D centers. We have two particular uh, illustrations of success in this field. One joint with Haldor Topso, which is a Danish catalysis company, and a second with a company called Sux from the Netherlands. It does OEM solutions in technology areas of software, mechatronics. Both of these companies saw the value in moving some of their research closer to their customers in the Chinese market. Jitri partnered with them uh, in the terms of the initial capital of the company, the registered capital. We require the overseas company to have more than 50% ownership stake. Typically, it's 60 to 80%. Jitri takes a very small stake, and the remainder generally goes to a local industrial park as another minority shareholder where the institute will be located. Then we will set up an operating fund for that JV for three to five years where most of that funding comes from the local government, including building, including capital equipment, so that the company can run that JV in a very asset light, uh, as, uh, capital light model to really focus on the research that they want to do. Uh, so that's the Jitri model for JVs on a local level. And I just wanted to very briefly tell you about something we're doing on a global level because the other issue is how can organizations at developing countries get a seat at the table with their sister organizations from developed countries? And so Jitri also helps to run this organization called Waitro, World Association of Industrial Technology Research Organizations. Uh, you can find their website, waitro.org. Waitro was started by UNIDO in 1970. It's an association of organizations focused on innovation, not of countries. And I think this is the key because countries always find reasons to disagree. Organizations are generally filled with people who want to work together to solve problems. And in Waitro, organizations from emerging and developing countries sit at the same table as equal partners. Uh, I don't want to hog the time, but Jitri is one part of the Waitro Secretariat in cooperation with the Fraunhofer Institute. The Waitro Innovation Ecosystem addresses the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we have an open innovation platform. We finance an innovation award on a two-year cycle. Um, we have a global innovation summit. You can find all this information on waitro.org. We also have partners such as in Africa, the Research Fairness Initiative, uh, Africa-Europe Innovation Partnership. And in fact, on June 30th, there will be a roundtable uh, sponsored by the Waitro Secretariat, looking at intellectual property issues around vaccines and patents, which is a very timely discussion, and that will be open to anybody that wants to join. Uh, so that's just a very brief summary of what Jitri and through Jitri Waitro are doing in the area of joint ventures. And uh, if you want any more information about Jitri, uh, please follow up later and uh, send me a, uh, a private message. That's all I've got. Let's we'll back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, that's extremely helpful, uh, Paul. Um, and I think it's, it's probably um, um, refreshing to some of our audience. Now, some of us may watch this live and some of us will watch this on YouTube later. That um, we have a uh, Western person. Uh, he, he, he's educated. He looks and speaks like a Western person working in the middle of a, um, a Chinese organization. But this Chinese organization has a um, practice which is um, probably not consistent with the common West conception of China state capitalism, that uh, there is a lot of uh, decentralization autonomies on these institutes with a lot of international cooperation. And in fact, the Chinese government insists that the foreigners, well, in, in a case where the, the technology comes from, the foreign teams, that the, the sponsors, in this case, you no know, foreign entities in, in you know, Scandinavia and Netherlands, uh, they actually control the, the institutes with a lot of the resource funded by the Chinese government. So it's really a hybrid that it's hard to put your fingers on either this way or that way, that... Uh, really epitomize the complexity of uh, a lot of um, institutions and economies and how market structures 
in developing markets, including in the case like China, that you can't really put a simple stereotype like this or that, but there's a lot of nuanced complexity behind it. Yeah. Um, and um, and I would just like to you know, make a few um, observations uh, to some of the, the factual statements that uh, uh, Paul made in the beginning. I think Paul was quite modest that despite the fact that Jiangsu is such a powerhouse in China, is actually the second largest economic entity, provincial entity in China. So it's the biggest Guangdong sex in Jiangsu that um, Paul was saying, hey, in terms of per capita GDP, is not so high compared to a lot of other countries. But because the statistics was conveyed at the provincial level. If you look at some of the cities within Jiangsu province, not, not the provincial capital, Nanjing, but cities like Suzhou and Wuxi, the capital GDP uh, is very high. It's, it's right there in, in, with many of the European countries. So there's that level of complexity that you that you, you can't even look at. You can't look at China, you can't even look at the province of China. You look, look at cities in China. And Paul, as you rightly said, that a lot of the institutes are in the southern part of Jiangsu, and the reason why the aggregate per capita GDP uh, of Jiangsu doesn't appear so high is you have averages between the southern part of Jiangsu, which is a lot more developed, a lot more prosperous, with the northern part of Jiangsu, which is less developed, less prosperous. So you have the Sunan and Subei. And actually... Um, Sunan is, is actually, um, which means southern part of, of, of Jiangsu, represent a kind of economic model, a kind of economic model which is very friendly to foreign investments, epitomized by the um, Sino-Singapore Industrial Park, which is part of you know, Suzhou. And, and that yep. we have that, a lot of institutes right there, Winston. Yeah. Within the so-called industrial park, which would actually, if you go there, it looks like Singapore. It's actually nicer than Singapore. Extremely affluent, extremely successful. Um, the, the per capita GDP, if you look at that level, the, the Sino-Singapore industrial, so-called industrial park is extremely high. And, and, and that gives you a flavor that is shaped by certain of the flavor institutions of Singapore, of making good infrastructure, having good institutions, making things all transparent, easy for foreign investors, and so on. So despite the fact that China is, many parts of China, for instance, Guangdong, uh, is, is so expensive now, it's so short of land now, it's not so friendly to foreign investment, except if you're extremely high tech, extremely high tech. Uh, Jiangsu is still a place really amenable to foreign investment because of that tradition of very good infrastructure, very transparent institutions, very welcome to the foreign investors. Um, so I think that um, provides a perspective that uh, when we look at uh, developing countries, sometimes we cannot simplify and look at things like China is like that, India is like that. There's a lot of variations, nuances within the country, in the case of the province, Jiangsu, even within Jiangsu province. So um, I think maybe we can switch perspective a bit and see you know, from um, another you know, you know, big, large development countries with tremendous potential, but with a different governance model, where the state are involved in development in a different way. Uh, not not like you know the say in this case of a certain provisional government of China and how um, foreign investors can navigate the landscape and be successful. Uh, maybe to you, Dr. Sandeep, as to your perspective of how um, at the firm level, not so much from the, from the state, the local state level, from the firm level, how companies can navigate in a situation where institutions are less developed compared to, you know, many Western countries. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, depends on the world where you're joining from. 
and first of all let me hope uh, by you know start by hoping that all of you are doing well and your loved ones are doing okay during this difficult times in the pandemic um, as it has disrupted not only lives but total businesses across the world as such uh, let me begin by giving a brief introduction of uh, asm group of institutions um, which is our one of our main um, uh, businesses Uh, we are a group of uh, education institutions which has education right from kindergarten going all the way up to the phd <clears throat> so we cover the whole uh, length and breadth of the education in fact even going into executive education as such <clears throat> and one of the uniqueness of asm has been that um, our focus has been on creating uh, innovative and employable students who can contribute to all levels of the society and we are doing this with a very unique methodology we developed called as edge excellence driven guaranteed employability programs because if you see the differences between india and the west in asia the students would be looking at the placements after doing an mba for example they look at the roi more uh, in the west that is not really that common as such hmm? uh but that is where uh, we uh, we have developed courses in associations with the industry to fulfill the requirement of the industry uh so for example you know when uh, amazon has started with the cloud computing in india in a big way <laughs> but we found that there are not enough right people working at the level of a cloud practitioner for example in india <laughs> so what we did was we worked with amazon and develop courses with them which can help create these people which the industry requires <laughs> the same thing we started doing with ibm ibm said we don't have people in the analytics domain so we said hey why not let's come together and develop a course around it <laughs> so uh, the same thing we did for finance we don't have people knowing international finance so you know we we got the cpa integrated into the mba for the first time <laughs> and um, so these are the innovative kind of courses which we are launching which are fulfilling the needs of the industry <laughs> uh, in fact one of our institutions uh, is a unique combination of chambers of commerce and industry between india and germany <laughs> so we had the bremen chamber of commerce in bremen we had the bremen hochschule there our institution and the maratha chamber of commerce and industry is in pune four of us coming together starting a course and an institution to solve the needs of the multinational companies which have come into pune or in india <laughs> so these companies said okay we have set up here but we are not getting the right kind of people who understand the globalized market who do not understand the logistics part of it logistics was not developed in india i'm talking 1995 at that time <laughs> but such collaborations are something which can help companies or others get the right talent when they moved uh, into the different markets and i am sure you know i think paul has covered that uh, in, in in his presentation of some of the things uh, what uh, they are doing as such in in order to get a good talent pool as such now uh, coming to the main part of the discussion today uh, you have asked me to to talk at the level of the corporations so when you look at most of the ceos Uh, of large corporations across the developed markets like north america europe and japan they acknowledge that globalization is one of the most critical challenges they are facing today <laughs> and it is very difficult to identify strategies to choose which countries to do business with <laughs> traditionally these companies have used their standardized uh, approaches to the new markets while sometimes they have experimented with a little local twist the result is that many multinational corporations are struggling to develop successful strategies in the emerging markets it is not easy to identify strategies for entering new international markets or to decide which countries to do business with <laughs> many firms go with what they know and they fall short of their goals the successful companies are the ones who develop strategies for doing business in emerging markets that are different from those at home and often find novel ways of implementing them <laughs> so uh, what firms should do is they should understand and take trouble 
to understand the institutional differences between the countries and they should choose likely to the best markets to enter selecting the optimal strategies and the making most out of operating in the in, uh, emerging markets many companies look at either the macro factors that is like the degree of openness or the social uh, political atmosphere or some of the market factors but very few pay attention to both and that is where the problem comes what people uh, in the west or the developed countries miss out is that there are institutional voids present in many of the emerging economies they lack the specialized intermediaries regulatory systems and contract enforcing methods and these gaps have made it difficult for the mncs to succeed in the developing nations as such so generally these companies take for granted the critical role what the soft infrastructure plays in the execution of the business models in the home uh for example you know i did talk of finding skill market research firms uh then you know they don't really understand uh, the specifics of the you know people's willingness to pay the logistics the transportation uh, the labor laws but many of these things are there uh, which uh, people are believing mainly and uh, have to go on with a gut feelings the analysis are that there but they could be misleading <laughs> so hence there could be a better approach to understand institutions variations between the countries and we could do it by understanding the context so uh, we have to understand the country's political and social systems its degree of openness its product markets labor markets and its capital markets and through this probably they can come out with strategies uh, which can work for the emerging markets let me come on to a few examples look at general electric they came up with that portable ultrasound technology or intel which came out with this inexpensive uh, classmate pc uh, so uh, what they what people are doing is uh, also uh, it, it they are finding it difficult to develop ideas in an uh, unfamiliar setting uh, we we had a talk about innovation earlier and the reverse innovation now is what is getting very important is how to create far from home and win everywhere <laughs> so i think this reverse innovation shows leaders and senior managers how to make innovation in emerging markets happen and how much innovations can unlock the opportunities throughout the world examples like general electric dre and company png pepsico uh i'll illustrate this fact uh, very well as such so when you are developing new products in emerging markets um i think uh, they should be looking at uh, innovation um and you should also be looking at r&d now if you look at india and china you find that many uh, companies have started to move a substantial part of their r&d to india and china this is largely driven by the availability of skilled personnel at a very low cost but these centers earlier primarily operated as extended arms of the r&d in the home country but now the dynamics have changed emerging markets require different kind of uh, innovations and many companies even startups now are choosing to set up in emerging markets rather than moving into uh, the uh, the developed world first and there are loads of benefits what we can get out of doing such things um again we we talked of the issues what are there and you know if we just talk of um, i since i am into education i can talk of education when we talk of education there are number of other intermediaries which uh, uh, are there uh, for example let's look at the rank area agencies which do accreditation yes india is a part of um, signed out with the washington accord but if the accsb was to evaluate 
the education institutions in Asia, I think they will not get a fair ranking compared to what the Western uh, institutions are getting. And this is mainly because uh, the accreditation systems are more tuned towards the West than towards India <laughs> or, or to the Asian countries. So there are other mechanisms available in India, like um, we, we've got the UGC, which has the National Accreditation Council, or there is a National Board of Accreditation of AICT, but the parameters are different. So the comparison definitely does not take place. <laughs> If you look at a foreign university to enter India, you, you won't find that happening. Uh, and the reasons are that, uh, A, the laws did not allow initially. India was protective of the education sector as such. But when they are allowing come, uh, uh, high quality foreign institutions to come, probably they are not taking that proactive step. And uh, this could be because there is a very, very highly regulated framework when you come to education uh, in, in, in India. And there is a concept of reservation uh, where um, uh, you, you have to take students from certain communities. Uh, they may have lesser marks, but you may have to take them in to have that diversity uh, as such. And again, there were, uh, you have to be a nonprofit to operate in India. And what the universities out are looking at is um, they need to give the same experience to a student as what they would give in their home country. And because of these institutional voids uh, which are present, that probably may not be possible. And that's why um, they don't look at coming. But because thanks to the corona now, um, that the online adoption of technology has been extremely high in the education sector. And um, even institutions like Harvard with the HBS online courses uh, are now looking at new markets and reaching out uh, using technology to the customers and students earlier whom Harvard could not reach out to, for example. Uh, so uh, uh, with the new education policy, which is coming up in India, it is totally revolutionizing the way the education landscape is in, in India. Uh, it's, they are getting a system which is absolutely multidisciplinary. It, they have multiple choice and they have even multiple entry and exits, which was never the traditional system. So they are creating an ABC, an academic bank of credit. So a student can come in any time and go in any time. Uh, uh, and then probably once he gets the credits, he gets that particular degree. And I think this is going to have a great impact uh, on the complete education system. Again, for the first time in 35 years, we have a system which looks from the kindergarten till the PhD as a whole and has strategies all the way to create uh, innovative and, uh, uh, you know, uh, to promote entrepreneurship skills among the people as such. Uh, so um, if, if we have to have... Um, Companies do well in the emerging markets. I think they have to understand the institutional voids. They would probably need to partner with uh, some uh, proper right uh, companies. Now, you know, let me just quickly take you through the case of say how it Harley Davidson has been in the news all over. They finally they have quit out of the Indian market. But what were the reasons? They chose just to do assembling in India, not full fledged manufacturing. And hence the tax was very high. Of course, COVID was one of the reasons, but they did not have a clear demand outlook. And they focused only on the cruiser segment. Now, cruiser segment is dying in India. but uh, uh, And there are no other cruiser uh, bikes in India other than BMW. But uh, if you look at uh, Royal Enfield, which is the biggest competitor uh, to uh, Harley, they have only one cruiser bike. And other than that, they offered, uh, uh, gave a very affordable, strong brand alternative to Harley Davidson. Mm. They were cheaper by almost a factor of five. Mm. And the marketing was not right. They did not understand the service backup. And then the backup was not really, uh, service backup was not good, especially when you buy something at such a high price. 
and they never customized anything to suit the local market which other companies started doing you know uh, the, they they went into the sports bike segments they went to the off roading segments as such and um, i think probably because of that it happened and the other important point was they did not partner with a local uh, body <laughs> bajaj for example partnered with britain's uh, triumph motorcycle bmw has partnered with tvs motors um, so um, i think that could be one of the other important things to be considered uh, when you talk of uh, getting into uh, emerging market as such uh, so uh, yes i i could go on and on but you could tell me when to stop <laughs> and these are very critical points for example see i have a, a 14 year old son who has started a company recently and um, he's got some innovations to help prevent the spread of the covid virus and is promoting creativity innovation and problem solving amongst kids and has got some fantastic courses lined up in crowdfunding as well as uh, in tie ups with uh, harvard and mit as such to to the asian market now he wanted to go to the gulf and set up there so setting up a company in gulf is pretty easy but the issue we found out was that you have to take a particular license if you want to operate a particular thing and when you go to a free zone and you take a license from there you cannot operate in another free zone <laughs> so so uh, there are huge number of restrictions which uh, initially no one thought of that okay it's very easy to do business in the uae and we have heard uh, uh, some of our friends tell that if you're in one zone and you start up your company it's very difficult to close it down and move to the another because of financial implication they wouldn't want you to shift from one free zone to another free zone so yes uh, so there are loads of challenges when we look at doing businesses in the emerging markets uh, and uh, i think if um, the governments the industry associations try to develop some um, uh, you know common goals and norms that is something which could help for example if you look at uh, the it industry uh, whatsapp twitter with the privacy rules every country is having that different own rules so we'll have to see the ways of how to get around it companies like apple are struggling in india and china because they are just following the the standard global model and probably um, india and china people require a phone with more than one sim card in the west they just cannot understand why do you require two sim cards <laughs> as such they require a bigger battery life and the other companies uh, which are doing that i think are you know doing much better in that front as such <laughs> well th- thank you sandeep and um So Deep you've used a lot of examples of you know the the entry of western companies into various emerging markets um and um you used example of you no know, um you no know, Holiday Davidson now of course there are you no know, many successful examples of either western companies or east asian companies in india for instance uh, on can gamble you know through micro packaging really you know expand in the market in india and the likes of lg and hande has been extremely successful in india now so that's one area that through whatever correct market entry strategy uh east asian firms western firms have been able to crack certain developing markets you mentioned you no know, Institution of law. Now that's a two-edged sword. There is the the, the um, examples of Western companies innovating appropriately to fill those void and and establish you no know, good industry strategies. 